Today's reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the Ark. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadam, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahil, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahil was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, tambourines, sistrums and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irrelevant act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the Ark of God. Then David was angry because of the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Peres Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Sittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Hear the words from the Holy Bible. Thank you, Catherine. So the title of my message today, A Lost Ark and a Lost Life. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time to gather around your word. We ask and pray that your spirit would move in our lives in the way that you know we need the ministry of your word. Father, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to begin by creating a hypothetical. Okay, so I need you to use your imagination. Most of us here are grandparents, so imagine you've been invited to the house of your grandchildren, and you arrive just as the opening credits are rolling on a film that they've started to watch. And they're saying, look, the film's already started, but it's okay. Grandma, Grandpa, come sit down with us. We want you to see this film. And what you see is this. This film is about the relationship between a single dad and his son. Now, the dad's extremely neurotic, he's very overprotective, and he's so controlled by fear that it causes him to be domineering. He's domineering to the point that he won't even let his son go to school. As a result, the, the son begins to resent his father. Now, finally, after much pressure, the son is saying, Dad, let me go to school, let me go to school. The dad relents, and off to school he goes. On his very first day, there's a school excursion. Now, his son is so upset by his father's controlling behavior that what he does is he acts out. He defiantly goes against his father's authority, and he acts in a way that places his life in danger. And what happens is he ends up being kidnapped. Now, the father's sensing profound guilt, and so what he does is sets out to save his son. Along the way, he gets help from a mentally unstable woman, and together they chase the kidnapper for thousands of miles. And yet throughout the whole film, you're wondering, what is up with this guy? 
Why is he so overprotective? Why is he so fearful of the world around him? Now, if you'd actually arrived maybe five minutes earlier at the house of your grandchildren, you would have seen what happened before the opening credits, and that would tell you why. Right at the very beginning of the film, the wife is killed by a violent predator. Not good. And in this same incident, uh, the lives of his unborn children are also claimed. Now, it sounds really awful, doesn't it? Can anyone guess the film? Can anyone guess the film? Finding Nemo. Who said that? <laughs> Check out the big brain on Amy. Is this going? I'm not meant to click at that. Oh, it's not even on. So it sounds like it's a, not a nice film, but it's actually Finding Nemo. Anyone seen this? Go and watch it with your kids. It's great. Okay? So there's the gang in Finding Nemo. There's Nemo. And there's his father, Marlon. Now, here's the deal with Finding Nemo. If you miss the start of the story, you don't get the full picture. If you miss what happens before those opening credits, you're left wondering why Marlon's the sort of dad that he is. But when you see it from the beginning of the story, you begin to realize the film's actually more than simply finding a lost son. The story's about Marlon finding himself. It's a story of him learning to let go and learning to allow his son to experience life in all of its uncertainty and peril. And as Marlon does that, he learns to live again as well. But if you miss the start of the story, you're in danger of missing the point. Now, what's that got to do with what we read today? Same deal. Our reading is very much like this. This story of the journey of the ark into Jerusalem is actually the tail end of a much longer story. And if you miss the beginning, then you're actually going to read this passage and you're not going to see it in the way that you otherwise should. What we saw in our reading today is this. One man is dead, another man is blessed. One man is dead simply for, 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 for touching the ark, for protecting the ark, and we read that and it seems harsh. Another man's blessed simply for housing the ark. So the question is, what's going on? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the beginning of the story. I'm going to do an overview, and I'm going to cover 1 Samuel chapters 4 to 6. So don't worry, following in your Bible, I'm going to give an overview of what happens in those, in those chapters. It actually begins with the Israelites. They're preparing for war against the Philistines. And the battle begins very badly for Israel. 4,000 men are killed. And so this prompts a question. The elders of Israel ask, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Did you hear those words? Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us before the Philistines? Now one thing my Old Testament lecturer used to say over and over and over. He'd say this, War in the ancient Near East was never simply a case of army versus army, nation versus nation. They believed it was God versus God. We go into battle, it's our God versus your God, and if we win, that means our God's more superior and more powerful than your God. So you can see how this has caused a problem for the, the elders of Israel. They believe that their God, Yahweh, is the one true God. Our God, Yahweh, is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the sovereign Lord, God Almighty. There's no way he's going to lose in battle. So for us, if we lose in battle, it's not because the God of the Philistines is more powerful. It's because Yahweh himself has brought defeat upon us as his people. And they're right. God's hand's against them because of the wicked leadership of Eli and his sons. Now here's where they go wrong. Rather than seeking the Lord and repenting, all they do is the elders send for the ark. And what they're thinking is the ark has been with Moses and Joshua in their victories, so they presume it's going to work for us as well. Do you see what's happening? It says that when the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. It's like the ground is shaking. And it says the Philistines were terrified. Such a great shout. They're thinking victory is guaranteed. It's in the bank. Or so they thought. There's a problem here. The problem is they're treating the ark like it's some sort of lucky charm. And they're about to learn the hard way that God cannot be manipulated, nor will he be taken for granted. You don't treat the living God 
with contempt. That's what they're about to learn. Can I say there's a difference between superstition and worship? God has promised to fight for his people if they're obedient to him. That lies at the heart of the covenant. But what we see is they've got little concern for the things of God, so God doesn't fight for them in battle. I think there's a lesson here for us as well. As God's people, we don't get to set him aside and pick him up again whenever it suits us. We okay with that? The ark comes into the camp. There's such a great big shout. The Philistines are terrified. The leaders have to say to them, men be brave. Let's fight. But they're terrified. A God has come into their camp. And no, 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 we must fight. And fight they do. And 30,000 Israel men die. The Philistines, they capture the ark. And they then go and march it back to Philistia. They place it in the temple of their god, Dagon. Now, this is a very interesting practice. I was meant to skip back to that. Hope you weren't distracted. This is an interesting practice. It's considered an act of humiliation. You humiliate your enemies by capturing the image of their god and putting it on display in your own temple. So in this case, what will happen is the Philistines, when they come to worship their god Dagon, Dagon's power and superiority over the god of Israel can be seen by all. It's making sense. So the next day, if you went to worship, here's what you saw. Dagon was prostrate on the ground before the ark. It's like he's face down in worship before Yahweh. And so what the Philistines do is they, they actually take Dagon and they stand him upright. What a powerful god. He can't even lift himself off the floor. Now, when I first read this, I, I used to picture Dagon as one of these small little idols. Okay? Now, many centuries later, what the Greeks would do was they would have these household gods and they'd keep them on the shelves in their home. But that's not Dagon. He's a god in a temple. His statue was big and it would have been heavy. So no one got to sneak in there in the middle of the night, pick up this little idol and put it back. No, no, no. It would have taken a great number of men to lift him back up. They saw what happened. In contrast, the, the ark is just relatively small. They say it was only maybe about a, a meter high and half a meter wide and long. The following morning, Dagon is again found on his face before the ark. But this time, his head and his hands have been broken off. Now, maybe you're wondering what's going on here. Here's what's happening. In the ancient Near East, if you want to know how many of your enemies you've killed in battle, what you'd do is you'd, you'd do a body count by collecting either their heads or their hands. And you would take them as trophies of war and you'd put them on display. Can you see the symbolism that's happening here? God is communicating something. Yes, the ark may have been captured, but this doesn't mean that Yahweh's been defeated. It's Dagon who lies dead at the feet of Yahweh. So why has the ark been captured? It's only been captured because Yahweh allowed it to be captured. It's a sign of judgment against his people. They expect we bring the ark into the camp and God's going to fight, with, fight for us. And God's saying, I'm not going to fight for you if you treat me with contempt. If they want the blessing of God, then what they need to do is treat his presence with, you know, with reverence. Don't treat the presence of God like it's some sort of good luck charm. And I think this poses an interesting question for us. What are we looking for when we look to God? You see, there's a big difference between seeking the hand of God and seeking the heart of God. Are we okay with this? I think of my own prayer life. I pray with far greater intensity when I need God to move in my life. I pray with far greater intensity when I need God to move in my circumstances when compared to actually seeking the presence of God. I once heard a story from an American missionary who worked for many years amongst Muslims in the Middle East. He said on three occasions he fasted during Ramadan. Now, if you know anything about Ramadan, the fast begins at dawn 
and it ends at sunset. That means for the whole day, there's no food and hardest of all, no water. You know, it's hot in the Middle East. Can you imagine going that whole day with no water? And he told of how one day, absolutely parched with thirst, he said, I opened my Bible and I read these words from Psalm 42, words we just sang. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts after you, O God. He said, as I read those words, I stood convicted. I'm thirsty. I need to parch my dry throat. I know what it means to truly pant for water. I know what it means to be desperate to quench my thirst. And then he thought to himself, do I truly long for God in the same way? I felt convicted. (laughs) We can know what it means to seek God intensely when crisis hits, but there's a subtle danger here. The subtle danger is that when our prayer life is most intense in response to the needs we have, I can cry out to God, God, I need you, I need you, I need you. And I throw up these SOS prayers. But the danger here is that we can begin to place a higher value on what God brings to us than rather who God is in in and of himself. Do you know what I'm talking about? This is my experience. I can pray so earnestly, longing for God to move. But when everything's okay, I'm not not as earnest in seeking his presence. The subtle danger is we begin to place a, a a, a greater sense of value or a greater sense of treasuring the gifts he brings rather than treasuring the giver himself. We look for the hand, but we we miss the heart. Do we need to take a deep breath? Are you with me? God's hand has been against his people, and it's about to, to be against the Philistines as well. In the town where the ark is situated, the people are afflicted with tumors, or as some translations say, hemorrhoids. Now, I'm not going to go there. I'm very tempted, but I won't say anything. (laughs) Tumors or hemorrhoids, take your pick. I know what I would choose. And rats are sent in plague proportions to destroy the fields. In response, the people demand, like, just get the ark out of our city. And so again, we see the ark is moved on to another Philistine city. But again, God's hands against them. And so there's an outbreak of disease, more rats. And they're like, "Just, just get this thing out of here. So once again, the ark moves on, goes to a city called Ekron. It doesn't even make it. The Bible says when they see the ark entering the city, they cry out in fear. And here's what they say. They have brought the ark of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. Rather than it being a trophy of war, it's become a curse to them. They've heard what's happened. I don't want a piece of this. They're meant to be boasting in this spoil of war and they're saying, get rid of it. It's gone. So what they do is they take some gold and they prepare a guilt offering. Gold tumors and gold rats. It's very symbolic. And they say, we'll send the ark back to Israel. Yahweh came, Yahweh saw, Yahweh conquered. The Philistines, they've learned a very hard lesson. You don't treat the God of Israel with contempt. So they get rid of the ark and they send it back to an Israelite town called Beth Shemesh. Now when the people see it, they don't reject it, they rejoice. Yes, the lost ark has been returned. It's been in the possession of the Philistines for seven months. What the Levites do is they take hold of the ark and the people offer a sacrifice to God. But some of them, they're they're, they're kind of curious. We'd like to take a look-see. Maybe we want to see the, the gold. They choose to look inside, and you're thinking, well, that's, that's okay. They're just being curious. No big deal, right? No big deal to look inside the ark. Now, if you've seen the film Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what happens next. You know the film. In the film, the Nazis think we can weaponize this ark and win the war. We can use it to, as, as a tool to wipe out our enemies. But what happens in the film is when they look inside, 
they unleash the angel of death. And they all meet a gruesome end. Something very similar happens to the people of Beth Shemesh. The Bible says God struck them down, putting them to death because they had looked into the ark. And again, you're left wondering why. Why was their curiosity considered being worthy of death? Here's what I think. Now that the ark was once more back in Israel, the people needed to know that it's more than some good luck charm. This is not something you can manipulate for your own ends. You need to learn that this ark is sacred. Not in some mystical sense. It's sacred because it's associated with the presence of a holy God. So you need to treat this with reverence. After this, the people mourn and they ask, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? They've seen the power of God unleashed. So naturally, they're afraid. Get this thing out of here. So the ark's removed. This time it goes to the house of a man named Abimadab. That just rolls off the tongue, that does. And there it remains in obscurity. It's tucked away and forgotten about until David brings it to Jerusalem many years later. That's the backstory. We've come full circle. David's now king. He's seeking to restore the ark to a place of prominence amongst the people. What we heard in our reading was actually a new beginning. This lost ark that's been out of sight and forgotten for a long time. And, 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 and as it's being brought back in front of the people, they're naturally celebrating. We're celebrating once again the presence of God is amongst his people. But it seems that there's still some lessons that need to be learned. If this is a new beginning, God doesn't want a repeat of what's happened in the past. God wants David to know that his presence should not be taken lightly, nor should it be taken for granted. He wants his people to know that it's not just about the ark being back in its rightful place. It's about God himself being before the people in his rightful place. So let's, let's consider again our reading. Verse 3. The ark is set on a brand new cart. Is this a good thing? Put the ark on a brand new cart. It's exactly what the Philistines did when they returned the ark to Israel. They're just copying what their neighbors did. But there's a problem. The law demands that it only be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. And so when that new cart falls because the oxen stumble... Uzzah, he instinctively reaches out to take hold of it. And even though his intentions are good, he's struck down dead. You're thinking, well, maybe is that a little too harsh? The Bible says the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there bes beside the ark. Do you notice that key word here? Irreverent act. He's acted in an unholy manner. What we're seeing here is that the people need to learn that they can't treat God as they see fit. God's saying, I'm not going to let you make the same mistakes your ancestors made in the past. Here's a reality we need to come to terms with, all of us. God is holy. And in our dealings with him, he sets the boundaries, not us. Are you okay with that? Oh, how we love to flip that. We need to understand we come to God on his terms. Utsa struck down dead so that Israel can learn that lesson. Now, how do you feel when you hear this? You know, sometimes I think it can be hard to reconcile this, you know, this picture of God we see in the Old Testament with what we see in the person of Jesus. Yeah? Yeah? You see, we often think that the Old Testament is about instant, on-the-spot judgment. If you sin, you die. Just like we heard in these stories. Is that your understanding? I used to have students say, Sir, why in the Bible, when you sin, you die in the Old Testament, but it's different in the New Testament? And I'd have to point out to them that actually this is largely untrue. Yes, you may see these instances of on-the-spot judgment, but you see them even in the New Testament. 
Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. But what you see throughout the whole Bible is usually God is slow to anger. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. Think about what we see in the prophets. God sends them, they warn the people, and they speak year after year before judgment actually comes. Why? Because God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering and he's patiently waiting for his people to respond, to return back to him. But when they don't, eventually judgment comes. I once heard someone say that in Cairo, when you break a traffic law, you don't receive an on-the-spot fine. Instead, what they do is they record the violation, and at the end of the year, you receive them all in one big hit. And so here you are, driving around, oblivious. You're thinking, I'm getting away with it. Then suddenly, bang, you get slugged. We need to be careful that this is not us. Just because God hasn't zapped us dead, don't, it, it doesn't mean that he's okay with willful sin. Never develop an attitude where you think, I'm a Christian, I'm covered by grace, I can sin, God will forgive me. That's making the exact same mistake that these people make. What you're doing is taking God for granted and you're treating grace with contempt. Don't do that. After Uzzah is struck down, David is afraid and he's angry. And then he questions, how can the ark even come to me? And so it's shipped off once more. The house of this unknown man, Obed-Edom, the Gittite. It's there for three months, and what we see is that he is blessed. I find this really interesting. In this entire drawn-out story, everyone who comes into contact with the ark is either dead, cursed, or living in fear. But the house of Obed-Edom is blessed. The Bible never actually says why. It just says he was blessed. So naturally it raises the question, why was this guy blessed? Here's my thoughts. I believe Israel needed to be reminded that God actually draws near in order to bless. God draws near to his people in order to bless. They needed to be reminded of that truth. Are we okay with this? Look at Jesus. When God draws near to the world in the person of Jesus, there's blessing. They needed to be reminded. A few years ago, a book was released called The Secret Life of Obed-Edom. Now, it was very similar to this book called The Prayer of Jabez. Anyone familiar with that? Okay. So in this book, what this guy does, The Secret Life of Obed-Edom, he, he fills out the story somewhat and he speculates as to why Obed-Edom was blessed. But here's his, here's his basic conclusion. He says this. He says, when we have the presence of God in our midst, blessing will follow. And so naturally, if you want greater material blessing in your life, you simply need to get more of God in your life. Let me say, I believe there's an element of truth in this. God does reward those who earnestly seek him, but we need to get this right. The goal of the Christian life goes way beyond material prosperity. Living a life of heaven on earth is not the prize. Becoming like Jesus is the prize. I'm glad you're with me on that. Here's the issue I have with these sorts of books. They reinforce the problem we saw in the beginning of this whole extended narrative. Do you remember? The focus was more on what God can do for his people than on who God was to his people. And I mentioned this subtle danger. We begin to cherish what God does for us over and above cherishing God himself. We love the gifts, but we neglect the giver. It's a very subtle danger. And let me say this, because this guy says, if you want more blessing, you just need more of God's presence. Let me say this when it comes to the presence of God. As Christians, we have God's Spirit indwelling us. So the issue is not whether we can get more of God, but whether we'll allow God to get more of us. I'm putting the horse before the cart. Are we okay with that? You've got God's Spirit. How much of God's Spirit has got you? 
Graham Johnston once put it this way. He said, you can't be more married or more pregnant. You're either married or you're not. You're either pregnant or you're not. He said, in the same way, you either have God's spirit or you don't. So we have God's spirit. The question is, does God's spirit have us? We okay with that? Once met a man from Syria in Khartoum who was a Muslim. He was a, a convert to Christianity and he said he would pose the following hypothetical to his Muslim neighbors. Here's what he'd say. He said, suppose you, you asked a woman to marry you and she agreed, but on one condition. You can live with her for only one month of the year, but in that month she will be exclusively yours. But for the rest of the year she'd be free to be with other men. And then he asked him, how would you feel about this arrangement? Would you, would you actually tolerate this? And they'd all be shaking their heads. His point was this. He's thinking about the, the practice of Ramadan, that one month of the year when they pay special devotion to God. And he'd be challenging him. He'd say, what about those other 11 months? Who is God to you in those other 11 months? Do you know, as he's talking, it, it, it really dawned on me. This can be us. We can be in danger of becoming Sunday Christians. Yeah? We come to church, we raise our hands, we sing some songs, we put the money in the offering. But has God truly captured our hearts? I'm speaking from experience here, guys. Okay, I, please, I'm preaching to myself. It can be so easy to go through the motions and get blasé about the presence of God. And I think that's the challenge that comes to us out of this story. So the question is, who is God to you right now? Who is God? Have you become casual about his presence in, in your life? Do you only see God for what he brings to the table, or does he actually command that rightful place of worship? If I'm frank, as I was preparing this message, I felt completely undone. I thought, who am I to stand in front of you all here and actually preach this word? But then I realized, actually, this is how all of us should be feeling in response to this, yeah? Completely undone in the presence of a holy God. Let me close with some words from John Piper. I'll close with these words because they encapsulate who God should be in our lives. John Piper asks the question, he says, what is sin? And his intention in asking this question is actually to redirect our attention to the fact that sin is more than just the bad things we do. Sin is actually the good things, the precious things that we don't do. What is sin? I don't know if you can read that. He says this. What is sin? The glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not save, savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted. The commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is sin. Could I ask you to bow your heads? We'll pray. Father, we all fall short of your glory. So the question that we heard posed today in your word, who can stand in the presence of a holy God? Father, we know that it's only by grace that we enter. It's only by grace that we stand. Not by human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Father, Jesus paid that price so that we can know and love you. Father, let the desire of our hearts lie beyond the blessings you bring. Teach us to truly treasure the precious gift of your presence. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.